this activist, he's saying to me, you know, he's like, people like my parents, they voted for a radical project already. Brexit is their radical right. project. And Jeremy Corbyn ultimately becomes one more person who is holding up their radical project. And they didn't want to hear about another one. Hello and welcome to Why Is This Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. You know, ever since 2016, when uh, the UK voted on Brexit in a referendum, and a lot of people, I think, in the UK and here in the US who are observers didn't think the referendum would go the way it did, which was to vote to leave the EU. And then it did, and it was this kind of shocking moment. And I remember at the time, Donald Trump was running for president in the US. He was about to, I think, about to be the nominee or was the nominee. And there was a kind of palpable sense of like, oh, it could happen here. <laughs> like, there has always seemed, I mean, the US and the UK have always had, as we'll talk about in this show, there's, there's always been a kind of connection between their politics in many ways. But that moment felt like a kind of wake-up call. It felt like it was channeling certain forces that are very powerful in both the US, UK, and across a lot of the Western democracies. And, you know, then Donald Trump did win. In fact, on election night, like Nigel Farage, one of the masterminds behind Brexit, was like at the Trump Tower celebrating with him. There's been a kind of linkage between this sort of, you know, nationalism as represented by Donald Trump's definition of it and the sort of Brexiteers' definition of it. And so throughout these last three years, both American and UK politics have been in turmoil, us because of Donald Trump, them because of trying to figure out how to actually leave the EU and what it would look like. They've gone through successive governments. And then they just had an election a few weeks ago, and Boris Johnson's conservative party cleaned up. Because it's a multi-party system, they got, I think, about 45, 46 percent of the vote. But they dominate parliament. Boris Johnson now has a mandate. They quickly moved forward with a Brexit plan. And Labour got its butt kicked. Uh, Labour led by Jeremy Corbyn. And immediately afterwards, and this includes myself, actually, there's a lot of hot takes about what it meant. It's very hard. There's, there's sort of two things to think about. It's hard not to make comparisons between the U.S. and U.K. precisely because of some of the shared political traditions, the kind of shared trajectories of both, say, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, and then later Bill Clinton and Tony Blair, and also because of the fact that Brexit and Trump seem so linked, both in the energies they're channeling and in also the times that they've come about. And so a lot of people look over there. I think a lot of people on the left particularly were really upset by the election, both on the merits of what it would mean for the UK and also for what it means here. So I wanted to do a conversation about what actually went down with labor in the UK, but I didn't want to do like a hot take one. <laughs> so I found the perfect person to talk about it, who's a, a, a journalist that I've known for years. She's a great journalist. She does a lot of incredible reporting about sort of grassroots movements. She's done stuff on teacher strikes, about labor. And over the last few years has, as you'll hear, spent a lot more time in the UK, both socially because she has friends there, but also reporting. And she was actually there in the run up to the election, writing about what was happening, very much embedded with a certain part of the labor movement, a certain part of the labor party that is the kind of vanguard of Jeremy Corbynism, this sort of left resurgence in the party. And so I thought she would be a great person to sort of give a firsthand account of what went down there and, and what some of the lessons are. Her name is Sarah Jaffe. She's a journalist and author. She's got a great book called Necessary Trouble, Americans in Revolt. She's also working on a second book, which we talk about in a bit. And I think Sarah's got a unique perspective because I think there's a lot of anger towards Jeremy Corbyn and labor amongst a lot of folks in the UK. In the Labour Party broadly, it, there's a kind of interfactional dispute, a kind of left versus center dispute that you see replicated here in U.S. politics in the center left. And a lot of people that feel like Jeremy Corbyn marched them off the plank, <laughs> that he basically had this zealous ideological vision that he pursued that the populace rejected and didn't want, and now labor is in terrible shape thanks to following this kind of vanguard movement. That's not an insane critique. I think there's some evidence that, that that's probably true, but it's a much more complicated picture. And I thought it would be interesting to hear from someone who is very close to and closely following the people who've been kind of the most vilified <laughs> in the wake of the reaction, in the wake of the election, the people around Corbyn, around a group called Momentum, which is sort of a, a faction within the Labour Party that supported Corbyn, very sort of actively socialist, very much rooted in like a left vision, a socialist vision. 
And Sarah has been reporting on those folks. So I thought rather than getting a perspective of someone who uh, wanted to kind of do point scoring afterwards because their ideological enemies have been vanquished, <laughs> that it would actually be really interesting to talk to someone who was there on the front lines with those people reporting on them, canvassing in some of the parts of the UK that labor lost badly, that were traditional strongholds. She's just got a great kind of ground eye view of what went down there. And I learned a lot from this conversation. And I think, you know, even if you're not interested in UK politics, what I would tell you is there are a lot of lessons to be drawn. <laughs> and there are some trends between us and them that are that are quite clear and quite robust. And I think you're going to want to hear what exactly went down. I guess my first question is, like, as a reporter from the left in the U.S. who reports on social movements, how yeah. you got involved in starting to follow U.K. politics. So it's actually because I had some random friends when I used to be a more of a pop culture journalist and I used to write about comic books. I became friends with a couple of British comic book writers. Huh. And the first time I went to the UK to visit them was 2010. It was right after the election then. And it was actually in the middle of the like Miliband v. Miliband fight to be leader of the Labour Party then. And I kind of remember arguing to my friends who are less like professionally political than I am why supporting like the slightly further left Miliband brother was an okay thing to do and wasn't going to immediately cause the party to like shed members. And, you know, the good old days when like Ed Miliband was the furthest left we thought that Labour could go. Yeah, I've sort of been paying attention ever since. And you've been there a lot reporting. Yeah, I've been there a lot lately. Yeah, you Um, just got back, right? So I spent the last three weeks there to cover the election. I was there before that in September for the party conference. And then I was living there this summer and did a big, long story on the Labor Party's community organizing unit, which is something that apparently nobody knew existed. And I stumbled into because I met somebody who worked for it, and she was like, you should write about us. I was like, I should write about you. And then, bless Dave Day and at the Prospect said, you can have 5,000 words to write about Labor's community organizing unit. And it's a fascinating, it's called Labor Secret Weapon. It's a very, it's a really fascinating piece. So one thing that maybe is a good place to start for Americans is that, like, Mm -hmm. In a way that no American party is, particularly not the Democratic Party, like yeah. the Labor Party was a socialist party. It yeah. was born mm-hmm. of socialism yeah. in like yes. to the extent of like singing the international yeah. at their conferences, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Like that is the roots of the Labor yes. Party. Yeah. And so there, there's, you know, the... The Red Scare that happened in this country to sort of beat socialism out of us didn't happen to the same extent in these other places, especially, you know, labor's big success was making the National Health Service after World War II when the country had been bombed to smithereens. And to rebuild a sense of social solidarity and actually also to take care of people, including many war veterans and people who had been damaged when the country was being bombed to smithereens, they institute the the National Health Service. So there is this tradition of socialism, both within the party and, you know, this broad understanding to the point where in this election, when Labor Party volunteers would say, like, you know, Boris Johnson wants to sell the NHS to Trump, people sort of didn't believe that you could do that. Like the NHS isn't going anywhere is so firmly rooted now that people can't imagine anything bad happening to it, even though it's been slowly chipped away at for and, years. And we should say Clement Attlee, who's the labor leader of the post-war right. period, who yeah. sort of knocks out the Churchill coalition and yes. is the, the father of the NHS, along with yes. the, the organizers who produced it. Yeah. The NHS is socialized medicine, right. literally. It's not yes. single payer. Like, right. it's government-run yeah. healthcare. Yes. Like, it's all the doctors work for the government. Yeah. And so when you look at that, there are a lot of differences from what we might have here. But one of the things that, like, I was talking to people on the campaign trail, and I would sort of have to explain to people what health insurance was, because they, they don't have any experience of anything like even Medicare. They just go to the doctor and the doctor treats you and you go home. And the biggest problem you have is sometimes it takes three weeks to get to see a GP because there have been so many budget cuts at the NHS. Yeah, there's a great viral video of like explaining the cost of an ambulance in the U.S. <sighs> yeah, to, yeah, yeah. To Brits and, that, and they're like, what are you talking about? Yeah. No, I had to explain to people what a deductible was. Right. So you have the NHS, but you also have a period, you know, Thatcher in the 1980s right. sort of privatizes huge parts of the economy. I mean, the, yeah, the, the miners' strikes. So in the U.S., right, we think about the thing that broke the unions in the U.S. was Reagan crushing the air traffic controllers union in right. 81. In the U.K., it was this big, massive strike against the miners, and the mines were all state-owned. So when you talk about, like, crushing the miners' strike, it was literally these are public employees, and they're also industrial workers. And, you know, a lot of the places that the Labor Party lost this election that just happened were the former mining belt. And these are places that, you know, they, they, for them to vote 
for a conservative is like right because shocking, Mar- right, right because Margaret Thatcher crushed them right. and like there were like protests sometimes yeah. very militant sometimes yes. violent like yeah. and this is a place where like this kind of socialist consciousness because you have a, it's state owned mm-hmm. plus a union yeah. right in the sort of like post war socialist vision of state-owned enterprise exactly. that Thatcher makes this break with and, yep. like, is a kind of generational scar for a lot of these folks. Right. And it's a really deep generational scar for a lot of these folks. And I was sort of trying to get at that in this piece that I wrote that went up today that I was thinking about the generation gap that's happening now is kind of people who are too young to remember Thatcherism, right? Like, people who are our age and younger who don't have that visceral experience of Thatcherism. And there's always this, I mean, one of the things I think we'll keep returning to, there's always yes. this sort of parallels between the U.S. and U.K. Of course. Reagan and Thatcher. And then you have Blair and Clinton. So the sort of left parties are in the wilderness. They're sort of defeated by these conservative Mm -hmm. neoliberal project that cuts taxes and privatizes. And then there's this thing called new labor. Like, what is new labor? New labor is the labor party's version of the third way, right? So it is Tony Blair and a bunch of other people, Peter Mandelson, et cetera, et cetera, decide that the way to win power again is to be a basically kinder, gentler version of the Tories, right? They're going to accept the privatizations. They're going to accept a certain level of consensus that the market is good, private ownership of things that used to be public is fine, and they're going to just do like a little bit more taxing and a little bit more tinkering around the edges to make sure that there aren't as many people sleeping in the streets as there are currently in across the UK. And this is something that, again, your listeners are familiar with as sort of Clintonism, right? right? Triangulation, third right. way. Right, exactly. That, that, you know, one of the ways that you do it is you beat up on your traditional base a little bit, assuming that they have nowhere else to go. And so in that case, right, Tony Blair represented this constituency that was a traditional labor safe seat that he was not from never went to. Right. Um, and people who come out of that tradition were like parachuted into these places. One of the places that I went canvassing was um, a place called Morley, which is right outside of Leeds. It is an old mining town. And it was the seat for a little while of Ed Balls, who was one of these new labor types. He was the shadow chancellor up until 2015 when he lost his seat to a Tory. I was out with these canvassers. They kept getting people like coming to the doors angry about Ed Balls, who is associated with this particular huh. previous period of the Labor Party. But these people remember, like, they just kind of parachuted people into our places, assuming that these were always going to be safe labor seats and that we had nowhere else to go if they moved right. And this is a problem that the Democratic Party knows all about, too, right? Because if you assume that people in Wisconsin or people in Yorkshire have nowhere else to go, They'll surprise you and find somewhere else to go or stay home. Although to argue on the other side, just in in terms of to sort of make a political defense of both Clinton's sort of third way and Blair's new labor, which were always kind of joined at the hip. I mean, explicitly Mm -hmm. so. Like they appeared together. The special relationship. Yeah, special relationship. They were both taking over parties that had had a really like rough go of it electorally. And they also did find like electoral success in this strategy. They did. Like Blair was until the Iraq war particularly, which... (laughs) Yeah. Sort of destroyed well, both. that's the interesting difference, right. right? Is that Blair came along a little bit later than Clinton, and Blair was George W. Bush's partner in the Iraq War. And so Tony Blair, you know, popped up today to give a speech about what the Labor Party needs to do. And the reaction to him is like a little stronger than it is to Clinton at this yes, point. Yes, because imagine because Clinton people are, plus Iraq War. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So people are literally like, you should be in The Hague. Right. right. Whenever he pops up to express an opinion. Mm-hmm. And they're not wrong. But <laughs> so this thing find success and margaret thatcher sort of famously said her greatest success was new labor right right? right. was the fact that the the labor party right that she had moved the common sense the overton window whatever we want to call it there is no alternative margaret thatcher is so eminently quotable yes you know there is no alternative was her thing and she said that when it was still sort of aspirational right when she was trying to destroy the labor party and she made it true. She made it into a sort of center-left neoliberal party right. that, that accepted a lot of the ideological policy prescriptions of right. neoliberalism, exactly. like increased market competition, mm-hmm. lower taxes, privatization particularly. And privatization is yes. a huge thing. I mean, Yes, and right, this... because Blair and Clinton continue the privatization process. So when we're talking about the NHS, again, right, like the, the people talking about Boris Johnson selling it to Trump, um, it's already been chipped away at in a variety of ways. And that continued through the Blair years. And so you had, by the end of the Blair period, and then Gordon Brown, and then the financial crisis, and then labor is in charge during the financial crisis. Again, slight shift from 
the U.S. and sort of gets blamed for all the bailouts and gets tossed out for David Cameron's conservative party, which was pretending to be a kinder, gentler, slightly more concerned with civil liberties, which is also an interesting point. Huh, interesting. Um, and so people who didn't like this and, and sort of reacted to the war, I have a good friend in the U.K. She lives far north, north of Newcastle. She voted for David Cameron in her first election in 2010. She's, you know, a little younger than me. She was mad about the Iraq war and believed that this Tory party was a different Tory party than Thatcher's. And that point is really important as we like sort of just track this history, which is that in the U.S., the Republican Party really owns the Iraq war, the yep. two big crises, yeah. the Iraq war and the financial and crisis, the financial crisis yeah. which is not the case there. Right. Yeah. Like New, New Labor, Labor owned these things. Right. New Labor owns those things. And then you get the Tories in power. Right. So then, then we get the coalition, which is also important because right. we should not let the Lib Dems off the hook here. Right. So the Liberal Democrats, who are the old Liberal Party that had sort of been supplanted as the second party in Britain. There were big scare quotes around that. I keep forgetting I'm not on video. Right. They fuse with the Social Democratic Party, become the Liberal Democrats, and they're sort of the also-ran party throughout this. They go into coalition with the, the Conservatives in 2010. And this was important Because Nick Clegg, the former leader of the Liberal Democrats, former nation intern like me and Chris. Yes. So was Ed Miliband. Um, (laughs) Well, I was never I prefer to claim Ed Miliband. (laughs) Yes. Nick Clegg Um, and Ed Miliband, both former nation interns. Ed Ed Miliband is a comrade. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. So Nick Clegg had run this sort of exciting campaign, right? I, I found out about him in part because, like, the nation was like, oh, former nation intern Nick Clegg makes a big splash, right? Then he proceeds to sell out every promise that he'd made by going into coalition with David Cameron, famously sort of imposing tuition fees that he had promised not to. So the Liberal Democrats sort of crushed their reputation for a generation, literally for a generation, right? Because it's the young people who remember right, the most because right. they were tempted by Clegg and all his promises to young people. And then and you get the 2010 student movement in the UK, which is a thing that is one of the roots of Corbynism. So the coalition government, the sort of answer to that in the Labour Party is to like inch leftward. And you got Ed Miliband and his brother David Miliband. And David Miliband's just like a hardcore Blairite, right? right? He is cut from that mold. Ed Miliband was like slightly further left. Their father, of course, like yes. one of the most famous labor socialist intellectuals. Yes, yes. Ralph Miliband. Parliamentary socialism. Yeah. It's a classic. Yeah. And right. So Ed Miliband is like, they called him Red Ed for being like, again, like slightly to the left. Of Like, not even as far far left as, like, Elizabeth Warren compared to the rest of the, you know. But he won. And then the election in 2015, he got stomped to the point where, like, the Tories no longer needed the Liberal Democrats and they were just in charge by themselves. Part of that, the thing that sort of everyone remembers was the pandering on nationalism and, Hmm. and sort of these mugs that said controls on immigration on them. When Corbyn took over the party, people were posting photos of, like, these controls on immigration mugs smashed, you know? Controls on immigration mugs from labor? Or yes, from... from labor. Oh, I see. Yes. So, so, this so... was this was the, the Miliband campaign in 2015. So the Miliband campaign was, had, yeah. was trying to, I mean, again, this... Trying to contain this nationalist nationalist by right, saying... By in... conceding to it, which it turns out doesn't work because people just vote for the actual nationalists. Right. Then you get Brexit. And the Brexit vote I think in this country, a lot of people assume it's sort of a partisan thing. And like the right wing wanted Brexit and the left wing wanted to not Brexit. And it's actually kind of sliced fairly neatly down the middle of both the Labour and the Conservative parties. So the actual Brexit fight was basically fought between two wings of the Tory party because they were in charge. Cameron, who was prime minister, who called the vote, but was, you know, the face of the Remain campaign. And Boris Johnson, who is now prime minister for probably five years, and Nigel Farage, who is the face of formerly the UK Independence Party, now the Brexit Party, buddies with Steve Bannon and all of these people. But Brexit Um, was a kind of right wing schismatic movement, essentially. Exactly. But it also sliced up the Labour Party. And before you get to Brexit, the Labour Party has, Ed Miliband has stepped down, fallen on his sword. And there was a tradition of the sort of left wing backbenchers of the Labour Party. One of them would always run for leadership and they would usually lose and they would get some symbolic votes from the other left backbenchers of the Labour Party. And this time, after Miliband lost, there was a small but significant move of people into the party. And another one of the other things that had happened was that Ed Miliband had 
made some moves to democratize the party. This gave the membership a bigger vote in selecting the leader, huh. and that allowed Jeremy Corbyn to win. So let's get into Jeremy Corbyn and what it meant for him to become the head of the Labor Party right after this. So Jeremy Corbyn wins pre-Brexit. We got the party that is a roots as a socialist party. Also, we should probably talk a little bit about just like parties in the UK are actual parties. Right, like, you pay a they're membership. They're not these sort of the... loose coalitions of things that right. they are in this country. The party is actually made up of people who are actually members who pay membership dues and it's also affiliated with the big trade unions the trade union congress all of these things are actually part of the labor party so the union leadership has a say in who becomes the leader the membership does and the members of parliament right do. so yeah it's a much more like to some kind of sense of yes. belonging to a party than yes. when you go here to become a you know you register you literally right. just like yeah. check a box yeah. there you're like a, la- a la- being a labor party me- right. member means something in right. a way that like being a democrat in a loose affiliation right. way doesn't right. mean here yeah and so the labor party was down to i think under 200,000 members at the low tide post miliband some people move into it start you know joining the labor party after cameron wins his second election in 2015 so they end up voting for this nice old grandpa who's been sitting on the back benches for his entire life, spending most of his time holding banners outside of the Labor Party conference for, you know, nuclear disarmament and going to picket lines and supporting Palestinian causes and things like that that ended up being things that were used to demonize him. But, you know, this was somebody who had never thought that he was going to be the leader of the Labor Party. And I think that is a thing we can't sort of emphasize enough that, like, he didn't spend his time building his resume to be the leader of a labor party. And so he had done things like meet with the IRA when they were still the IRA. He had done things like, you know. Appear in an event with a member of Hamas and call him his brother. Exactly, right. And so these are things that like, you know, again, (laughs) were not things you would do if you were like burnishing your career to be like, I'm going to run the labor party one day. These are things you do if you're basically a left activist whose day job happens to be being in parliament. Right. And that is why a lot of people love him. That's why, like, a lot of people within the party really viscerally love him because, like, union members remember him showing up to picket lines. They remember him and John McDonald. Everybody has a story. Everybody sort of on the left in the U.K. has a John McDonald story and a Jeremy Corbyn story and a Diane Abbott story of these people showing up for them. These are essentially left-wing activists. Yes. In a way, even... That was probably true of Bernie Sanders in his 30s, but not in the last 25 years, which is a sort of a little bit of the difference Mm -hmm. that like their careers as left wing activists where they might be at an event with someone from Hamas, as Mm -hmm. Jeremy Corbyn was. Yeah. Yeah. Which I just want to say is like my own editorializing here, like problematic morally, but tactically is another thing. Yeah. That extended much further into the arc of Jeremy Corbyn's career than Bernie Sanders, who sort of like kind of goes straight a little bit because he ends up... he sort of becomes a little bit more of a politician. Yeah, because he gets elected and then he's elected as the at-large member for for Vermont and then he's in the U.S. Senate, even though Bernie Sanders' background is as a kind of a left-wing agitator. Oh, yeah, I mean, there's a letter that he wrote to Margaret Thatcher uh, trying to get the IRA prisoners off of hunger strike, right? Right, so that's Um, a perfect example. Like, it's just further in the past a bit than Corbyn. Yeah. And also a little less connected to, like, international yes. leftism. Yes, and I think that's a really, really important thing because it has been both, again, both good and bad. It was very important in terms of, like, we have a rising international fascist movement, and I think that we need to think more internationally, which is another reason I keep leaving this country, about how to stop it. And also, it turned out to be very easy to demonize him as sort of being un-British. And if we get to the anti-Semitism stuff, I have a lot of thoughts on the way that, you know, essentially accusing Jeremy Corbyn of being anti-Semitic, they would have accused him of being a secret Jew 40 years earlier. It seemed to me there were sort of like two things going on. One is that yeah. like there was genuine anti-Semitism in parts of the Labour Party. There are genuine anti-Semitism like across the world. Right. And particularly in Britain. Like it's fascinating to me. Like in a real like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The comments I kept, I mean, again, yeah. I understand that many people who support Corbyn feel like this was essentially a manipulated story. But at the same time, it was like, a manipulated story. The Facebook, also, there is anti Semitism. Yeah, like the Facebook yeah. comments that kept popping up from like actual yeah. MPs or party members were like, what the hell are yeah. you saying? And it yeah. just seemed like that was not A, excusable, and B, like 
to the degree it was weaponized, which clearly it was, there was also a thing there that was a problem. Yeah, and I think the real thing that they didn't handle well was that the way that this is happening, and this happens with Israel, and this happens with, you know, we could talk about this for like three hours because I'm really angry about the way it's happening to Ilhan Omar, for example. The fact that like in the last week, two op-eds have come out saying that Bernie Sanders might be our first Jewish president is anti-Semitic. So like, you know, we know what this means now, right? Anti-Semitic is like also code for thinks Palestinians are human. And I should say I'm Jewish. Right. Um, And so there's two things, right? One is that like Britain is more anti-Semitic as a whole, has fewer Jewish people as a whole than the U.S. Two is that when you don't talk about capitalism for 30 or 40 years within your supposedly anti-capitalist party, but also in the wider world, and then there is a financial crisis caused by bankers. People start Googling and they find some horrifying stuff. So I have a friend who writes about money and right. the money system and all of these things and gives a lot of talks across Europe about it. And he's like, yeah, people come to my talks and they have like very honest, heartfelt, sincere questions about how the Rothschilds control all the central banks. Yeah. Like people yes. think this is true. Yes. And in the age of bad Facebook ads and everything, like people are finding conspiracy theories as, you know, Chip Berlay would say, right, like, an attempt to try to explain the world. Yeah. It's very easy. And you could see this at Occupy, too, for instance. Like, people would sort of stumble into anti-Semitic conspiracy theories about Jewish bankers as a sincere attempt to understand what had just happened. Yeah. And the solution to this, I am not a political strategist. I am a journalist. But, like, the thing that I think it wouldn't have deflected it entirely, but it needed to be said is that A, the solution to this is not just purging everybody who's ever repeated a conspiracy theory. The solution to this is an actual program of political education that explains how capitalism actually works and that it's not about a handful of, you know, greedy Jewish or not Jewish bankers, but it's actually the structures of the system. And B, connect it to a broad program of anti-racist education. Because what's happening and what happens with Israel and what happens with these attacks on Ilhan Omar is that the right is very effectively splitting Jews from the rest of people who are racialized, othered, whatevered, and saying, like, our interests are over here. Our interests are with Israel. Our interests are with the Republican Party. Our interests are with sort of bunker mentality and separating ourselves from people like Ilhan Omar, from people like any number of Muslim members of the Labour Party and Muslim peoples in the UK who are facing, like, extreme increases of violence since Brexit. And ironically, because the EU migrants are harder to pick out on the street. But, you know, the people who have faced a lot of the racism that's increased in the UK in the last however many years are, in many cases, like South Asian British people who've been there for a generation, but are Muslim, wear hijab on the subway, you know? I mean, it seems to me also like there's there's the old Marx line about anti-Semitism being the socialism of fools, fools, which is is part of a little bit of what you're saying there in terms of these yes, conspiracy definitely. theories. Yeah. It does seem to me like you have to like. So here's my you have per- to go at those you things have to, head on. Like, you cannot. And, and you have to sort also of like pretend they're not there. Like the, my personal experience, the closest version I had this, and I actually think about this right now as I watch Trump, is the 9/11 truthers mm-hmm. who were everywhere in the left yeah. from oh, 2001 yeah. to 2004. Oh, yeah. And I mean everywhere. Like yeah. you and I were in those circles and oh, like yeah. you couldn't go to a single event without like the first question would always be like and, <laughs> and you they know, still have a table at left for him. I mean it, and it's like it <laughs> yeah. was the job of people to be like no this is wrong. Yeah. This exactly. is wrong. You're wrong. Exactly. This is wrong and this it's also wrong. bad. And it's let like me explain wrong, to you what actually it's, happened. It's also insidious particularly when yes. you start to getting like the Jews didn't go to work. Right. Exactly. The Israelis were like. Exactly. I just feel like I understand the impulse that people feel like Corbyn was wrong by the media, but it just also— I mean, he absolutely was, right. but, like, there is, but it, there's, there is also a strategy here that was not handled yes. well. And, and we also, can say like, that. I, I, yes, and I actually think it's more than strategic. I think it's, like, in the same way I felt this way about, I felt this way about 9-11 truthers. Like, it was yeah. a moral imperative yes. to stop that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Because it's just yeah. corrosive and, and wrong. And I think for like, me, for, very much for me, I am experiencing this in a way— that I never have before of, like, feeling not white Uh in this world, right? Uh I grew up outside of Boston. I grew up in towns where there were always a significant number of Jewish kids in the schools I went to. I went to Hebrew school. I moved to South Carolina when I was 16. That was a little bit weird because there were definitely people like, you're Jewish, huh? Uh -huh. What's that like? 
And I went to college in New Orleans, but I went to Tulane, which certainly had a lot of Jews at yes. it. And, um, and I've spent most of the rest of my life in the Northeast. So to realize that, like, actual anti-Semitism is, in fact, rising, that there are people who are marching on Charlottesville chanting, Jew will not replace us, and shooting up synagogues in Pittsburgh, that is, like, viscerally frightening to and me who, for the first time ever. And who, we should say, like, in the case of the Pittsburgh shooter, a right-wing racist. Yeah, these are coming from the right. But also is, like... If you look at the manifesto, it's like Jews control the world and they control the banks. Like, exactly. you don't have to go exactly. very far no, to I mean, get to are, that these stuff. These are very old conspiracy yes. theories and they are not hard to find on the internet. And they are being deliberately propagated again now by an actual, like, movement that is, again, as I said, like, it is nationalist. It is also international in that, you know, people are talking to each other. Steve Bannon is certainly hopping around the world talking to uh, far right leaders wherever. And so. The solution to all of this is not to double down. It is certainly not to, like, isolate yourself further. Yeah. The solution to this, and I feel this, like, very viscerally and strongly, is that I have to be in every anti-racist fight. Right. I'm a journalist. I don't sign things in support of politicians. I signed a letter of Jews in support of Ilan Omar because I was just like, this is bull. Yeah. And I see what they're doing here. And I will not actually be a pawn in that. So you've got so just to so anyway wait, right well this now is all, that we've gotten personal no I think this is all really important context because I think you know th there's a bunch of things about Corbyn and Corbynism that are interesting here yeah. right so you've got a person who's basically been the ideological wilderness for most of his career yes. as New Labour has moved yeah. to the center right so yeah. he is someone who's a backbencher mm -hmm. he's like an old leftist yeah. with all that that means mm -hmm. both good and bad yes. both yeah. strategically morally politically mm -hmm. he's carrying a lot of that baggage but he also represents this like very clean ideological break mm -hmm. with what had been there yeah. right and so the sort of Anti-Semitism, I think, is sort of adjacent to the critique mm -hmm. of him. You know, well, this is what I mean when I say that, like the, the IRA, the and way like that, that they like, attempted to other him was always connecting him to things that were seen as sort of not British, right? right. So, in saying that he's anti-Semitic, what they're actually sort of doing is is bringing up Hamas, it's bringing up terrorists, right? He's a terrorist sympathizer. What they're doing is essentially associating him with Muslims, right? Yeah. This ongoing fear, like I said, where like the fear of immigration that is ostensibly being tied to like leaving the European Union is actually being felt on the ground level more by British Muslims than anybody else. That's who's facing the violence, really. And so when you see the way that this happened, it was particularly easy on some level to do to somebody like Jeremy Corbyn because of this history that he had of being an internationalist. Also, you know, being a principled opponent of things like the Iraq war that his party was charging into. That's certainly true. Also, I do not believe that if somebody who is, you know, again, young and fresh faced and wasn't around for some of these things becomes leader of the Labour Party, right. but I still mean, has a socialist platform, that they're going to be any nicer to them. Right. Although it's also like, again, I keep saying this about Trump, where it's like, and this was true of Clinton, where it's like people can be out to get you and you can still screw up. Like, yes, uh, which is a very important thing about Clinton, which I think about a lot as we're yep. watching impeachment and think about 21 years ago, which is like. It was both the case. There was like a right wing conspiracy yeah. to bring him down, mm -hmm. and he should not have done I know, what he exactly, did. Like, right? Like, right. Yeah. like those are, and, yeah. and so, so, so Corbynism yeah. kind of comes out of nowhere, and and I think represents this kind of interesting cohort effect where mm -hmm. younger people, and we see it with mm -hmm. younger people telling yeah. themselves socialists. We see it in the Democratic primary cross tabs in the yeah. U.S., where mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders has fifty percent of the vote of people under thirty five. Mm -hmm. That there's particularly in the wake of the financial crisis, there's yeah. this kind of like rediscovering of a certain left. kind yeah. of vision that rejects finance capitalism yeah. and the kind of precariousness yeah. of work and all mm -hmm. these things. People find that very electrifying. Yeah. He has this post-Brexit, has this sort of very surprise, great election 2017, right, right where labor yeah. increases seats. Yeah. So that brings us up to this latest election. First, talk about like momentum and Corbynism. Yeah, so momentum was this thing that was started by a handful of people who were supporting Corbyn's bid to become Labour leader. And this was the thing, again, we talked about in 2015 after Ed Miliband steps down, Corbyn puts his name forward and a bunch of activists are kind of like, this is the time we need actually a left leader for the party. We need to take it back. And they formed this group, which like the UK didn't sort of have things like move on and stuff like that before, huh, right? The, the equivalent of that really wasn't there. And so momentum is sort of formed in part 
to be just a group within the Labour Party that supported Corbyn's bid. And there, it exists in this weird tension, right? Because it was always sort of, are we going to be a thing that is here to just pull the Labour Party left? Or are we going to be a thing that exists to support Jeremy Corbyn? Huh, and because of all the internal fighting, like we skipped over the two times that the party tried to get rid of him right. and failed. And each time they got massive boosts in membership so that the Labour Party now has over 500,000 members. It is the largest socialist party, I think, by membership in the world. This is over and over again, sort of because the right wing of the party tried to get rid of him. So momentum was supposed to be a thing that could support and advance the left of the Labour Party. It sort of became something that is a little bit more just like there to support Corbyn and Corbynism. What it's done importantly in both this election and the previous election was to mobilize those 500,000 members who are maybe concentrated, again, they're mostly young people. The geographic distribution of sort of young people is a thing that I think we should talk about and yeah. understand because it's also true in this country. What deindustrialization has meant to a lot of places, a lot of formerly decent sized cities, is that there are no jobs there for young people. And so the they leave. leave. Yeah. So right. they move back to New York, Philadelphia, right. Boston the places where the jobs are, the Bay Area. And that means that you get even more sort of concentration of left votes in these places and no young people. Again, I mentioned Morley where I was canvassing in Yorkshire, right, that this is a place where um, the young people leave because what are they going to do there? The young people that stay are basically doing care work for the people who are older who maybe used to work in the mines. What Momentum did very, very successfully in this past election, they moved something like 100,000 people use their online tools to find places to go canvas when they lived in safe seats. They also do a lot of online stuff. They make memes. They do videos. They do sort of function as like a propaganda shop, again, for, for the left wing of the Labor Party. But in terms of like activist groups in places, I went to Bristol. I stayed with a couple of folks that I had met at the Labor Party conference who are active in Momentum and The World Transformed, which is... Another sort of thing that came out of the Corbyn movement, technically it's a conference that happens alongside the Labor Party conference that is, again, for the left wing of the party to talk about ideas, ideas that ended up sort of trickling up into the party manifesto, things like the four-day week, abolishing private schools, fun stuff like that sort of gets discussed in these places, and that actually moved into the party. So these folks in Bristol in particular, I like this story, Um, one of the reasons I went there is that the MP in Bristol Northwest is a guy who says Tony Blair is his hero, right? He is from the right wing of the party. He was elected for the first time in 2017 in that big swing towards labor because essentially momentum activists said, well, we think this is a movable district and we're going to canvas here. And we're going to do sort of persuasive canvassing of the type that the party had not really done under Blair. And they swung the district and got this guy elected who proceeds to, you know, constantly undermine Corbyn at every move. And they got him reelected in 2019, going out in the streets for this guy, again, who is essentially not on their side. But that's who the young activists are. That's who is doing the door knocking for even the right wing labor MPs, of which there aren't as many now. There's sort of three prongs, I think, to Corbyn's kind of theory of the case going into this. My understanding is like this sort of like field mobilization through momentum mm-hmm. and door knocking. Yeah. The manifesto, which yeah. is a very sort of forthrightly economic populist socialist yeah. document that yeah. pledges to a, a variety of universal variety benefits. Of yeah. It's enormous. In fact, one of the critiques afterwards was like, it's yeah. too much. It's not a message. Yeah. And then sort of this idea that like the way you win back these people that you've mm-hmm. lost to the Tories, yeah. right, is that you give them some class-based sort of old-time socialist religion yeah. about going to them, going to their doorstep and being like, these are where your material interests are yeah. in this old mining town and deindustrialization. Right. We're here to give you something tangible. Yeah. Yeah. That's a thing that you hear here around mm-hmm. Sanders, particularly when you think about yeah. the parts of the Midwest. And the post-election argument from the people who have had the knives out for Corbin forever, right. and not all of them, is like, that failed. That basically, yeah. like, you guys had a theory of the case, like, forthright socialism, mobilization, yeah. give people something. Yeah. And they you like the thing that we said, your critics, which is that you're moving too far left yeah. and voters don't want it, yeah. that we were right and you guys were wrong. Well, the interesting thing here, the really sort of interesting and also depressing thing is that the par- the policies are popular. Right. 
the policies, even the sort of most radical ones, poll well. People actually want to renationalize everything, build things like a national care service, which is one of my favorites, which is essentially building an army of home care workers and actually paying them decent wages, which is not something we do in this country either. These things were actually really popular. And one of the things, and I I asked this of Faiza Shaheen, who is one of the the sort of labor star candidates who did not end up winning the seat. She was running for a seat in the northeast of London. And she was like, you know, the hardest thing is actually convincing people we can do it. They say it all sounds amazing. How are you going to do it? Right. And that is, you know, capitalist realism. There is no alternative. It is a hell of a drug. And when you look at, again, that age breakdown, younger people believe you can do it. Yes. Older people who lived through Thatcherism do not believe that you can do it. And that was the breakdown. And that's a thing that I think is really important. The other thing that I think we understand that, like, mobilization can only do so much in a six-week election. And we should, you know, we're Americans. We're sitting through year two of the Democratic primary. This election was called in November, happened December 12th. Six-week election. There's only so much persuasion you can do in six weeks. Usually the last six weeks of an American presidential election are just get out the vote, right? But labor did have this thing, does have this thing that we mentioned at the beginning, this community organizing unit that was brought in to do sort of American-style community organizing that something like ACORN used to do, the Center for Popular Democracy-aligned groups still do in this country, but do it within the party. And so you have things like an organizer in Putney, which is one of the few places that Labor actually took a seat off of the conservatives this election, organizing in a housing block where somebody had essentially, they found them on Twitter. Somebody was saying, like, this could be the next Grenfell, Grenfell Tower being a public housing block that burned down the week after the 2017 election, killed 72 people. And part of the reason it burned was they had put this cladding on the outside of the building to make it more attractive to the rich people who lived in the surrounding neighborhood. So the party sends this organizer into this housing block and says, what's going on here? They find all this horrifying stuff. They find like electrical wires sitting in standing water, all of this stuff, right? And so she's organizing with these people. And it's not like organize and vote for the Labor Party. It's like organize and we're going to demand the landlord show up. We're going to do, again, this sort of old style community organizing. And they did this. They were in 30 constituencies around the country. They had organizers in these places. One of them had like a storefront, you know, was essentially like labor drop in center. And another thing that they did was they were having these events in these constituencies. I went to a few of them this summer with John McDonnell, the shadow chancellor, with Rebecca Long Bailey, who's essentially, she's the architect of their green industrial revolution, their answer to the Green New Deal, in these places to say, like, okay, what do you need? Right. We're here in Cornwall with, you know, 150 Labor Party members, activists, and random people who've been invited to come to this thing. And we're going to have you all sit down at tables and talk about what you need. And we're going to listen and we're going to gather this information and we're going to try to put this into our manifesto. And so this stuff was attempting not just to say, like, here's a thing we can give to you in Motherwell outside of Glasgow or in Cornwall or in Morecambe or wherever it is. Right. But here's actually like we listen to you telling us what you need and we want to build policies to do that. And it was only it's only been in existence for 18 months. But it is striking to me now in reading so many sort of recriminatory hot takes, how many people say that what labor needs to do is exactly what it was already trying to do. Right. It just seemed to me like there's this kind of remember when like Howard Dean's people came into Iowa with the orange hats. Like there's a little bit of this like cultural vanguardist barrier to this. If you got this young cohort of people who are sort of ideologically committed to this Mm -hmm. project. Yeah. And the project itself polls popularly, which I don't discount. And that's true in the U.S., like, you know, about a lot of things, right? Mm -hmm. Like the wealth tax polls at 70%. Yeah. Although, you know, that— Universal health care is always— —has had majority support since before Bernie Sanders ran for president. I mean, that and $3 gets you on the subway, though, right? Because, like— Exactly. People don't vote for policies. They vote for parties and Well, and and this is also why Brexit succeeds, right? Is Brexit is a thing that you could vote for the policy. You didn't have to believe a politician in order to vote for Brexit. You just had to be like, yeah, this thing. Yeah. And I I find that really interesting. Boris Johnson sort of successfully attached himself to this thing that people had already voted for and said, get Brexit done. And he has like manifesto, what manifesto? The conservatives didn't have one, basically, this election. 
I think the thing that happened was that Jeremy Corbyn was very successfully demonized, again, for some things that were true and some things that were not true. And people didn't believe, A, that it was possible to do these things anyway, and B, didn't believe that he would do it. Right. Didn't trust him to do it. I mean, he was I, 40 points underwater. Yeah. Or, yeah. Like, and I think that that's purple. a real, the real challenge is that, you know, again, like we, you, you talk about Russia constantly, but like, what does it look like in elections where you cannot depend on the information that you're getting? Yeah. What does it mean to be, I mean, I think about this as a journalist, right? And I'm sure you do too. Like, how do we get through to people who are not already our audience? Mm -hmm. One of my biggest barometers for whether I've done a story that's good is whether some of the folks that I've met doing previous reporting share it on Facebook. So like the president of the Lordstown UAW local, when he shares a story that I've written about unions on Facebook, I'm like, yes. Right. Because I'm like, this guy is not like one of my friends. Right. right? I mean, he's a lovely human being. Right. I think he's great. But like that feels to me like, OK, I'm like figuring out how to get out of my bubble of 20-something, 30-something, and 40-something, you know, lefties who live in a big city. Right. How do we actually cross over? And how do you fight, you know, the massive amount of just lies and dark money that are flowing into these elections? This is our problem, right? Right. What, are, what do the ads that are being served right now as we have the impeachment debate on TV above our heads, what are people who are, like, favorable to Trump getting served on Facebook about this right yeah. now? Some, you know, some wild shit. Right. <laughs> and so what do we do to actually like there was a study that came out during the campaign that said 88 percent of the conservative ads were lies. Some percentage of the liberal Democrats ads were lies and zero percent of labor's ads were lies. Hmm. Well, great. That uh, that also in three bucks will get you on the subway. Right. right. You you had truthful ads. Right. Great. What now? Like, this I mean, is this is the terrifying question for me, really, is like we can talk all day about the ways that Corbin screwed up. Yeah, right. But how do you teach basic media literacy yeah. in this moment when you can't count on much of anything? Well, this is where there does seem to be like a few really intense similarities. Yeah, like yeah. one, of course, is that the generational cross tabs. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yes. You know, labor wins voters under 35 yeah. by a sizable uh, majority. They, I think it was 39 this time, and it was 45 last time. Yeah. So that was the the shift. But, like, yeah, it is it is literally, like, us and younger. Right. right? Yes. Um, right? I was born in 1980. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, right. So it's, like, literally, like, us and younger, they win. And, and they get their over ass, that. And particularly over 65, they get and destroyed. Again, destroyed. And, right. They get absolutely destroyed. And they also get destroyed among the analog to the, say, white working class industrial Midwest of the U.S. Mm -hmm. yeah. in the U.K., yes. places that had been labor towns, that had been, right. you know, what we call the Rust Belt. The, right. The equivalent of, you know, losing Ohio and Wisconsin to right. Trump. Yes. Right. Um, the thing that like and again, they sort of ha made the same mistake almost as Hillary Clinton. Right. Like Hillary Clinton not going to Wisconsin is a thing that I'm going to like put on my gravestone, uh, die mad about. Right. The same thing. Like you assumed that these were safe seats. But in reality, they had been shedding labor votes since Tony Blair. That was I was looking at a chart. I think it was Bishop Auckland that was just like the majority however many years ago was like 20,000 for labor and each time down it was smaller even in 2017 when labor had that resurgence the majority was like a couple hundred votes and then this time they lost it this is an ongoing problem and they did see that this was a problem yeah and they did understand that like these places they should be ours and they're not anymore and we need to shore this up and we need to work in it and one of the things I think maybe people will look at is like, were those people placed sort of too offensively? Like after 2017, a lot of the, the events that I went to were in marginals that labor was targeting, in swing districts that labor wanted to win, that were currently held by the conservatives, right. rather than sort of shoring up their right. constituencies that they might lose. Um, and that's that's a strategic question. <laughs> but the understanding that like this was happening it's not like nobody in Labor Party headquarters knew this was a problem. They did not fix it fast enough. And, you know, it's just it's just depressing, right? It's just it just sucks. Well, it's like, depressing, there's no but way it's... around it to just be like, oh, these people voted for somebody that is actually going to screw them. Yeah. And I hate sort of false consciousness arguments about like people voting against I their material too, interests. Yeah. But like 
But God, maybe, Boris Johnson is the worst. Right, but maybe their interest, I mean, this and this get, brings us to Brexit, right? Because what, yes. what Boris Johnson was wielding was the ultimate yeah. wedge issue. Yes. It neatly cleaved labor in half. Um, mm-hmm. It there were there were yeah. labor remainers and labor Brexiteers. Yeah, he had sort of reformed the Tory party mm-hmm. yeah, around Brexit. Yeah, he had shed some he, of his own people. Right, so he kind of got rid of his own divisions. Yeah. Yeah. and then he basically ran on this thing that cut right through the heart of it. Mm-hmm. And when you talk about like, well, what are these people voting for? Well, they're voting for they're voting to be British. Well, they're, they're voting, also I'm voting the, for other things though. And so one of the things that um, one of the exit poll numbers. Oh yeah, this is the, I know this number you're going to say. The, the NHS, NHS, yeah, right. Well, what was the big bu- us that was driving around during Brexit is yeah. we we send however many million pounds a week to the EU. Let's spend it on our NHS instead. Right. When Brexit runs in in uh, 2016, right. one of the things they say is like, if we get out of the EU, we'll have more money for the NHS because right. everyone loves the NHS exactly. and we're just sending the EU all this money. Right. So then fast forward to 2019 and you have this election in right. which like the party of the NHS, right? Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn, like. Yeah. Say whatever you want about Jeremy Corbyn. Like that's the party of like investment in the government-run healthcare created that, by the but, Labour like, Party. You literally have like doctors and nurses like posting ads and and confront or posting videos and like confronting Boris Johnson every time he goes into a hospital and about cuts and austerity. Yeah, exactly. And yet the exit poll says that. People trusted Boris Johnson more yeah. on the NHS yeah. than Jeremy freaking Corbyn, yeah. Yeah. which just says that, like, that's your, if you can't, like, that's your core issue. That's yeah. your thing. If you cannot win voters' trust on that. So I was talking to this organizer who is from Durham, which is one of the constituencies that lost and lost a really great young MP who people were talking about as a future labor leader, Laura Pidcock, which is just a real bummer. Um, you have these districts, again, that are sort of stereotypically white working class. Although, again, when I was canvassing in Morley, we knocked on plenty of doors of people who were not white. And a lot of the canvassers were also people who were not white. Like, to overstate the whiteness of these areas is always a bad idea. Like, Trump taking pictures with young black women who are working the assembly line at the carrier plant. You know, we have to remember that these are not monolithic areas. Right. So anyway, this activist, he's involved with Lesbians and Gays Support the Migrants, which is obviously inspired by Lesbians and Gays Support the Miners, which was during the 1980s, during the miner strike that we mm. talked about. And he's also, you know, a white guy from the North. And he's saying to me, you know, he's like, people in where my parents live, people like my parents, they voted for a radical project already. Brexit is their radical right. project. And Jeremy Corbyn ultimately becomes one more person who is holding up their radical project. And they didn't want to hear about another one. No. Yeah, right. That's what I mean. Like, that's not false consciousness. That's saying this is true in the U.S. People vote for all kinds of things. Yeah. If you are like, it makes me feel I don't like the EU. I want to control our national and destiny. And there are good reasons to not like the EU, we sure. should also say. Yes, like, I EU. remember Greece. Yes, yes. The, um, there are lots of critiques of the EU. But, yeah. like, I feel like my country's being taken over by people that aren't us. Yeah. And I want us to get it. To, like, that's a reason to affirmatively vote for a thing. It may not be, like, a defensible one from some moral perspective or whatever you want to say. Yeah. But that is a reason. And, like, yeah. Brexit was that for yeah. a lot of people. Yeah. And people... You know, people did, in fact, believe that if we just get out of the EU, then the money will go into the NHS and the NHS is being squeezed because we've got too many immigrants here. And if we just get rid of some immigrants and stop giving that money to the EU, we will fix the problems with the NHS. And you don't need this weird guy who's telling you that we're going to, you know, invest however much in bringing in new nurses. So that, I think, is a real problem. And the thing about it is that labor lost votes on both sides. Yes. Right. It lost votes to the Lib Dems and the Greens on one side. It lost votes on the other side. Right. Lib Dems and Greens were both remain. Right. And Labor, which had been kind of like, we're going to abide by the vote earlier, Mm -hmm. came around to proposing Came around to the second second referendum referendum position, sort of not soon enough to please the hard remain crowd and also not. Yeah, you know, that's it real. Wasn't, that's real betwixt and between. Yeah, territory exactly. No, from and it's, it's it's a and that is the problem that I don't know how you solve. No, because I've got not, answers for a lot of the other ones. Right. But like, well, I don't. I actually don't have an answer for the media question either, which right. is unfortunate because that's what I'm supposed to be good at. Right. But the Brexit issue, I just don't know how you solve it. And there were people before, right? There was a moment right before the election was called. There was a Saturday that Parliament went in to meet on a Saturday. And I was texting with my friend because I was over here at the time. I was texting with a friend of mine and was just like, you know, are they going to vote for it? Because it, it like all Boris Johnson's Brexit deal almost passed and then it didn't. And then they called an election. And there were people that day who were saying, like, maybe we just let them do it so we can move on. Yeah. I don't know if that would have been the right thing to do. 
I don't think there was anywhere a, any good place to go, which is why, like I said, like Jeremy Corbyn's original position on Brexit, which is, oh, do we have to? OK, yes, I guess we should stay is kind of the right one. But like there was no room for nuance in a yes yeah. or no referendum. Yep. Sarah Jaffe is the author of Necessary Trouble, Americans in Revolt. She's a fellow at the Type Media Center, uh, independent journalist. And her new book that I'm looking at the cover of, Work mm -hmm. Won't Love You Back. That's a really good title. Uh, and that'll be out? Uh, probably January of 2021. All right. Got well, a ways work, still. Okay. Work Won't Love You Back, January 2021. But there is now a cover for it. Sarah, thanks so much. Thank you. Once again, great thanks to Sarah Jaffe. You can find her book, Necessary Trouble, Americans in Revolt, and her next book, Work Won't Love You Back, which will be out in a few years. So look for that. As always, we love your feedback. Tweet us the hashtag withpod, email withpod at gmail.com. Why is this happening is presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by the All In team and features music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here by going to mbcnews.com slash why is this happening.